Now I would like to ask Mr. Marek Benio, Associate Professor at the Department of Public Economy and Administration, Krakow University, University of Economics. Probably you have pro re presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Can we start? Yes, thank you very much. I could easily use all my six minutes to express the gratitude for being invited here. Um, <laughs> members of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, I'm a researcher, and I was uh, very keen on um, uh, seeing some um, reasons for uh, proposing that directive. And we hear that in our union, uh, the same uh, work should be remunerated in the same manner. That's the part of the famous speech of Jean-Claude Juncker from 2014, and uh, it's not about equal pay. It's about equal terms of calculating the pay. And if you read the proposal correctly, it's about equal terms of calculating the pay and not about equalizing the pay. I wanted to make it clear at the beginning because another assumption behind this proposal is that we need more posting, not less. Those are the very words of Commissioner Marianne Tyson. And then we hear in the proposal, thank you very much, we see in the proposal that uh, how are we going to achieve more posting, not less? Well, basically by making it more complicated and expensive and limited in time. That raised really curiosity in me as a researcher. Then we hear that we need fairer rules and a level playing field. Those are also the uh, citations from Commissioner Tyson. So I thought, okay, we have unleveled playing fields, so we need to know who's got tough alive, the local companies, local service companies, or posting companies. So I checked it, and uh, we've done a survey. It's a very modest survey. I'm sorry, because we've, uh, we've got only 16 answers. It's, it's not impressive. But... Under these 16 questionnaires, we've covered 20,623 portable documents A1. So those are more than 20,000 incidents of postings. And if you use uh, a very conservative limitation of the number of A1s towards the number of actual workers, we'll end up with some 13 to 15,000 of posted workers covered by this survey, and that survey covered three years, 2013, 14, and 15. This is very important because most of the postings is going to be to Germany, where in the first two years of survey, there was no Mindestlohn, the minimum uh, wage uh, regulation. So um, we checked um, uh, the structure of the cost of posting of workers, of the labor costs, and the biggest advantage of that research is that it derives from real data from the books of those companies who sent the, the, the questionnaires. And those are high quality uh, sample. This is high quality sample because those are all the companies that went through all possible uh, uh, local authorities' controls and they survived it. Uh, and. Uh, so the, the shortcomings of that uh, research is that it covers only few companies and there is some kind of self-selection, uh, but it's more than 20,000 A1. Uh, most of them uh, were posted to Germany, uh, some to France, and then to Belgium, which shows that it's, it represents more or less the, the representative sample. Uh, as far as the post, uh, sector of posting is concerned, most of them to construction sector, some to care for elderly se uh, sector, to production sector, logistics, and to metal sector. And the first findings I came to was that the, net, the, the lowest net earnings of a posted worker covered by that survey was €5.98. Net, that's after taxes and contributions. But if you look at the uh, average earnings of posted workers, this is almost 10 euro. That's more, that's almost 15, 16% more than the required minimum rates of pay. 
And here, the first assumption falls that posting is based on cheap labor. No, they could be paid less. They are paid a little bit more than minimum rates of pay, but of course a little bit less if you compare it to average earnings in the receiving country. Uh, but that's a very important, the, the first very important conclusion. The second conclusion is that there are some labor costs that are related only and exclusively to the fact that the service is provided in another member state. Those are the costs that the companies occur every time when they cross the border and there was, no, there was supposed not to be borders. So except for net wages and tax and contributions, which you pay well, wherever you, you hire a worker, there are some cross-border costs, and I've divided them in variable costs and fixed costs. Um, let's keep the social security contributions. Those variable and fixed costs that are uh, connected only with crossing the border are accommodation, travel, board, compensation from, for fixed term contracts, and the first four, I believe, uh, could be also the burden of a local company. But if you think of cost of translation, cost of hiring a person to contact with uh, labor inspection in the receiving country, the cost of uh, hiring a person who applies for A1 documents, those are additional costs that the local companies never will occur. They just will never occur. May I ask for conclusion? Yes, thank you very much. And the conclusion is that those extra costs uh, amount to 29% of the total labor costs, which means that uh, the, the, the posting companies do have extra costs that the local companies do not have. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much.